Welcome to Blind Spot. I'm Steve Reardon. I'm very happy to welcome on the show this week Professor Jeffrey Pfeffer. Jeffrey Pfeffer is the Thomas D. D. The second professor of organizational behavior at the Graduate School of Business at Stanford University, where he has taught since 1979. He is the co-author or author of 14 books, including The Human Equation, Building Profits by Putting People First, and Power, Why Some People Have It and Others Don't. Professor Pfeffer, welcome to Blind Spot. It's a pleasure to be here with you. So I want to um, I want to get right into I guess the core of the message today, and and I want to talk a little bit about why power is a blind spot for people. So a large part of your work is focused kind of on power and power dynamics. What do people not understand about power? My goodness, what do they understand about power? <laughs> maybe maybe a a simpler way to approach it. I think many people believe that their hard work and good performance will be sufficient to propel their careers, and that's I certainly I think a certain. A huge blind spot. I think people believe that the world is a just and fair place and they will, and people get what they deserve. I think that's another huge blind spot. So those would be the two biggest ones that, that, that your work itself will be sufficient. Um, and as you don't have to do what some of my friends and colleagues call schmoozing. Um, and secondly, that, uh, that the world is fair and that, you know, if you behave inappropriately or do bad things, uh, you will get brought down. And by the same token, if you are a good human being, uh, you're going to rise to the top. Right. So I guess what's interesting is why do people believe that? I mean, you know, why does karma have better marketing than than power, right? I mean, why is there this inherent belief in humans that they they want to believe that the world is a just and fair place? Um, so Robert Zients, who came up with this idea of the just world hypothesis many decades ago, has, I think, some explanations. I'm not sure that we've tested them sufficiently for me to answer this question with great uh, confidence. But I think one of the things is if the world is adjusted, if, 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 if there, if there are a set of rules and you play by the rules, life becomes predictable. And I think human beings seek a sense of predictability and controllability. And this idea that the world, you know, has rules and the rules are fair, you play by the rules, you'll succeed, I think gives people the sense that they are in control of their own destiny and that the world is not as random as it is, um, actually. And luck doesn't play as large a larger role as it does uh, occasionally. I believe that's a piece of it. And I think another piece of it is, is that um, we are reared in our religious institutions and by our parents uh, to a certain set of um, uh, ways of being and a set of standards of conduct that we, in quotes, should do. And I think many people confuse the should with the what works. Right, right. I mean, that's very interesting. I mean, I guess just, I mean, narrowing down on one of those, you know, here in the Valley, there was this huge uh, emphasis on being authentic. And I guess, you know, it's a, it's a huge trigger word for a lot of people. And everyone thinks that's the way to get ahead in the valley. You think this is wrong? It's completely wrong. I mean, you know, the valley, I, I mean, there's no evidence for this whatsoever. So, so you know, if you want to understand Steve Jobs, you need to go find, and I believe he is still alive, Regis McKenna, uh, the basically the public relations person who made Steve Jobs. Uh, if you were to be able to find, which it would be hard to do now, tapes from the original Steve Jobs presentations at Apple and the final Steve Jobs completely different. He's, he, he remade himself. Um, uh, the first reading for this class, Jack Dorsey, uh, a reconstruction. I mean, basically the legend of Jack Dorsey is, 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 is mostly fabricated. Um, and you can go down the list of the, the, this is, you know, the Valley. This is the supposed founder of Twitter. Jack the, suppo Dorsey. the supposed founder of Twitter who wasn't actually the founder of Twitter and whose role in Twitter has been greatly mythologized as many of these uh, founders roles have been, including, you know, what Steve did and the, his skills and whatever. I mean, we, we have this great person theory and we, and the people play into it and they build themselves up. The, but the idea of authenticity and the valley going together, I mean, the valley is the, is, is the, is the almost, epicenter of hype so how can hype and authenticity go together but you know whatever mm. i mean it's amazing that 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 is like sort of it's almost a meme that's gotten into the mind of people and i mean i guess related to that um there is something that people talk a lot about uh, i guess the social currency of vulnerability right this idea that being vulnerable is a way to engender influence and power and success 
Is that something that you see, or is that also something that is... Well, you know, often it, it depends upon vulnerable to what and to whom. Um, I have friends that will tell you that when they're... Um, including Herminia Barra, who teaches at INSEAD, who has a very good book on this very issue. And she tells in there a story of a woman who arrives at some senior role, I think it was at a bank, but I'm not exactly sure. You can read her Harvard Business Review article about this. The woman arrives and says, you know, I'm not sure I'm qualified for the job, blah, blah, blah. And in the next five seconds, of course, people begin to take her down. So um, I think you want to show vulnerability. Um, it's uh, uh, Vulnerability is often an artifice. Um, and and, uh, and but you want you, you don't want to show vulnerability about things that uh, people can use against you. Mm. So I guess why I mean the 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 counteraction to this is why is power important? I mean why is it important in people's lives? Because power is fundamental in how organizations operate and how the world operates, and social power is an inherent piece of. Almost every social relationship, including, you know, intimate relationships such as marriage and certainly including in work relationships, powers how things get done, how disputes get settled, how we decide what we're going to do. And as I say in power, why some people have it and others don't, at the end, I mean, if you read the British epidemiologist Sir Michael Marmot's work um, on the so-called Whitehall studies, which is studies of the British civil service, the higher the civil service rank you were, the less likely you were to die um, from cardiac cardiovascular disease or to have a cardiovascular event. And that's because the higher you are in the social hierarchy, the more control you have over your life and over your work. Mm -hmm. And have not having control over your life and not having control over what you do and when you do it is extremely stressful. So job control is the variable there. So I did the last line in the book says something to the effect of seek powers if your life depends upon it because it does. So power is, is a road to riches and it's actually a road to longer life. Mm. Are there costs? Are there costs to just pursuing power? Of course. Uh, the economists are right. Life is filled with trade-offs. Um, there are many costs. They're not costs of pursuing power. They're costs of actually getting power. Uh, one of the costs of power is visibility. I mean, do you want to be under a lot of scrutiny? Do you want people watching your every move? Do you want people... Um, you know, paying attention to everything you do. Um, many of the stories, not so favorable stories about Stanford University and for that matter, Stanford Business School in the last two or three or four years, uh, probably would not have run if the same events had happened at, you know, I don't know, Mississippi State or, you know, Appalachian State or someplace. So Stanford's power, institutional prominence, puts it under much more scrutiny. You're Individual prominence is going to give you much more individual scrutiny. And so, you know, if you become, as my friend Rudy Crew will talk about, the school's chancellor of New York or the school superintendent of Miami, people are going to feel free uh, to comment about not only your job performance, uh, but they're going to feel free to comment about, you know, the car you drive and where you live and who you spend your time with and everything else. So the, 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 one of the prices is visibility. One of the other prices is trust dilemma. Uh, you know, now, you know, you're Mr. Reardon, everybody likes you and whatever, uh, you become Mr. Reardon CEO. And when people come up to you and flatter you, you don't know if it's sincere or if they're trying to get something out of you. Right. When people say they want to have lunch with you, you don't know if it's because they really want to have lunch with you or if there's some instrumental reason. So relationships become much more instrumental. That would be another price. Mm -hmm. So I guess just laying some of the groundwork, and I don't mean to give away too much of the book because I think people should, uh, Go out and buy it. It's available at all good booksellers everywhere. But yeah. you, you can't be, you shouldn't be authentic. Uh, obviously, you need to watch your vulnerability. What should you be doing to build up your power? Um, I think you ought to be um, building relationships with people who can be helpful to you, which first requires you figuring out who can be helpful to you and then figuring out how to make a connection with them, um, which is the theme of today's class. I think that's extremely important. Um, I think you need to develop the personal attributes um, that produce power, some of which are very developable, such as the ability to read other human beings, such as the ability to, um, to tolerate conflict, such as not worrying obsessively. Um, uh, about whether or not people like you or approve of what you're doing. Um, I think it's, uh, you know, I think you can build up your energy and stamina. I think all of these are so the personal qualities, uh, the social relationships. Um, you need to, um, you need to be, I think, much more 
strategic about how you spend. I think people need to be much more strategic about how they spend their time and, um, and, and, and what they're, what they're trying to achieve and how, and, and get a plan for how they're going to get there. Mm. So we are very comfortable with having a strategy for our companies and our businesses. And we think about what we're willing to do and what we're not willing to do and the, the, the ex- external alliances we're willing to build and not. When you, we ought to take that same logic and apply it to our careers because we are in fact, you know, managing ourselves. Right. I mean, so a lot of people kind of run their lives and I guess think about it this way. Do you still sort of believe in this Machiavellian divide, this divide between kind of career, uh, you know, being ruthless and pursuit of power at work and, and sort of splitting that off in your personal life? Or do you think everything bleeds together? Um, I, you know, I'm not sure you should be is the same. I mean, I think people are different in different spheres of their lives. There are people, you know, who've... Um, who are very warm and sweet at home and are not the same way at the office. People, I think, people occupy different roles and it, and the expectations for your behavior is different in those different roles. And so I think you're going to behave differently in those different roles. Um, and that's, I think, natural and it's quite fine. Mm. You're quite you're quite skeptical about intelligence being a big predictor of power or, or it being overplayed. I mean, there is some good research that it does indicate, you know, some of the stuff you said earlier, you know, rising up through the ranks. Um, sort of, I guess, I'm interested in why you're as skeptical as you are about the intelligence piece. Well, I think intelligence is important, but as you rise up in the organization, um, it's uh, the dumb people are never they get they get filtered out. The people who can't who who aren't smart enough to do their jobs with a reasonable level of competence uh, don't aren't in the game after a while. Right. And so then the question becomes, what differentiates the people who are playing? Uh, who are playing in the tournament at a very high level, and intelligence has been basically largely removed from the equation. They're all pretty equal on that. And what I think really differentiates them at that point is their political skill. Mm. Um, one of the things I wanted to touch on and just ask about is, is do you think about you know power moves um, and what people do to get power and how that's related to, I guess, kind of the the discussion around privilege and bias gender and race, those with perceived privilege, do they have any more of an effect on on some of these power moves? Um, Is there any good research on this? So um, so a former doctoral student of mine who actually teaches my class now at the University of Virginia did his thesis on uh, social class and power. And one of his findings uh, was that um, people from lower social classes are less – they understand the same as the upper class people um, uh, this, uh, that there are two kinds of sets of strategies. One you might call a performance based strategy, and one might, you might call a political strategy. And they understand that both of them contribute to power, but they are personally less willing um, to engage in uh, the um, uh, the more political stuff. Now it turns out when you reframe it and talk about engaging in the stuff in those tactics, not for yourself but for your community, because they're more community oriented, then they then they become comfortable with it. The pre- one of the most interesting findings that Peter did in his class, in a part of me, in his study, was to look at whether or not uh, social class predicted choice of electives at the GSB. And so he looked at a bunch of OBA, so he got so he collected people's self-reported social class and um, and then looked at what classes they were planning to take. And with one exception, there was no effect of class on their choice of electives. With power, there was. Uh, the higher your social class, the more likely you were to be interested in taking this as an elective, oh, wow. which is completely consistent with this idea that uh, the, 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 the social class and privilege probably makes you more – Willing to, or receptive to, or skilled at mm. uh, the the power and politics stuff. And I mean, in terms of gender, you know, one of the things I always think about coming back to like the vulnerability thing is, you know, if you're a a physically dominating white male, I think it can be. I think the vulnerability thing can be very empowering and can be very endearing for people. Whereas women perhaps have a different tool set. So you mentioned the the instance of, of a woman being vulnerable earlier, I feel like that's something they pay a higher penalty for. Do you think that's right? Or it's just it's just a different tactic that they have to employ? Oh, I think, um, you know, 
Uh, not all white males are tall. I had the privilege of knowing the famous Jack Valenti, the head of the Motion Picture Association of America, for 38 years. He was five feet four. Um, but he filled the room with his persona, and he filled the room with his language, and he filled the room with his presence, if you will. So I think it's not a matter so much of physiognomy as it is of how you carry yourself. Right. Amy Cuddy's TED Talk, I don't know actually how tall Amy is, mm. uh, but, you know, Amy Cuddy's TED Talk about, you know, presence and this idea idea of um of adopting a dominant pose and and uh, when you come the, when we come to the part of the class I do uh, I do the superwoman before every podcast yeah thinking. yeah well you know I'm so, no I mean you know when, you, when we come to the part on acting and speaking with power one of the things that great actors do is they get themselves ready you know so if you're going to go out and you're going to play an imposing thing you need to kind of you know center yourself and anchor and train your voice and practice all this stuff so I uh, so um this so I don't think it's it's so much to do with with physi- with, with physiognomy. Okay. Um, so I guess while we're on while we're on the gender thing, I, I wanted to touch on the election. When you were watching the election, I guess over the course of last year, how did you look at the candidates in terms of some of your research? I mean, you know, it's very clear. Uh, looking back on it now, Donald Trump employed you know a ton of these strategies, and <laughs> Scott Adams talked about influence strategies and all sorts of stuff. I mean, do you, was, do you think he's good at this? I mean, I don't think he's ever read anything about it, but I think he's a natural at it. As as, as you know, so on November the ninth, I got many emails from people who said that we now have our first past the power president, <laughs> <laughs> uh, and and in many respects, I think that's right. I mean, I think the, he keeps it next to his bed. I, I mean, don't I believe that. that. <laughs> um, I think uh, you know he. So the reading for the, for the, for today's class, which is a reading that I highly recommend, Malcolm Gladwell, how David beats Goliath, yeah. and and how David beats Goliath is basically by by breaking the rules, um, and um, and if you look at the so the so the meta theme of the election, and we can talk about this in more detail if you want, but the meta theme of the election is is is, is Hillary Clinton was the ultimate rule-following candidate in terms of the strategies and how she ran her campaign and everything else. And Donald Trump was the ultimate rule-breaking candidate. Right. And I think that says something, you know, not only did that give him an advantage, but she didn't really know how to cope with someone as very often as, and you see this in warfare as well. When people play by a different set of rules, they use asymmetric warfare, call it what you will, it puts... The, you know, the Goliaths, if you will, they don't know how to use their power. They don't know really, really what to do. So yes, Donald, I mean, there were a thousand mistakes that Hillary Clinton made and many things that Donald Trump did right. And, uh, you know, so yes, he, he, he definitely understood many, not just, not just from this class, but from the social psychology that underlies this class. I mean, he's just much better at this. So let's get into some of the weeds there. I mean, I'd like to hear your opinion on, on kind of, if you look at Hillary's campaign, Campaign, were you advising her? I mean, let's play Monday no. morning quarterback um, and just sort of say, you know, wh- what do you think she did do wrong? I mean, in, in this realm. Oh, so to take, I'll give, I'll, I will take two examples. There are thousands. So I'll take two examples. So during, I have a friend on whose board I said, actually, who's a part owner of the Chicago Cubs. So because of that, I watched the World Series. And during the World Series, I'm quite struck. I was quite struck by um, the fact that uh, there was a Hillary Clinton ad uh, run during the World Series in Northern California. Now, you can target the ads. It's not clear to me why you would waste a dollar <laughs> on an ad in Northern California if you're Hillary Clinton, but that's okay. Holding that aside, if you look at the ad she ran, and this is a very famous ad. It's the ad of uh, both uh, – there's an ad that she ran with children. Yeah. There's an ad she ran with women. Yeah. And if you look at the images in that ad, holding aside the children and the women, the most – visible image in that ad besides the children and the women was Donald Trump. There is this thing called the mere exposure effect. Most of Hillary Clinton's ads, if you turn off the sound, look like they're ads for Donald Trump. Right. And so that's a huge mistake. This is a criticism about the love Trump's hate like line. I mean, you put his name in yes. your slogan, right? I mean, yes. Yeah, I mean, you know, he's, it's just giving him more exposure and more legitimacy. And legitimacy gets me to the second big mistake she made. So when, uh, when, when Comey releases this thing about the emails, she and all her helpers, in quotes, go on the news media and make a big deal out of it. What you do if you've got some report or something that you don't like is you trivialize it. Mm. You don't make a big deal out of it's it. It's locker room but, talk. 
Right? It's yeah, locker room talk. That's right. And, and, and go on. Who cares? <laughs> you know, I, uh, did I, you know, did I, you know, did I make a sexual advance to this woman? Look at her. She does, you know, <laughs> who would have such bad taste? And, and then you go on with the conversation. You trivialize it. You don't have day after day of news. And by the way, this is advice for people inside of organizations. If somebody comes out with a report that is counter to what you think the organization should do, you don't have a big debate with it, which elevates its importance. Instead, you do the opposite. You say, well, this is some academic exercise. Nobody would take it seriously. Yeah. What does he know? Right? Okay. Well, I mean, that's that's really interesting. Um, you spoke in class about 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 her voice and getting a voice coach? Is that something that you had thought about before or about Hillary? Um, well, you know, I think uh, there's no question that uh, that there is uh, gender bias. Mm -hmm. There's gender bias in politics, particularly in the U.S. Uh, there's gender bias in the workplace. Um, and some of that has to do with voice and uh, whether you sound authoritative and whatever. Uh, part of this is also the fact that I think one of the things working against her was that she was a woman. So if you go to this, this research that's been done basically with the following form, they give people a list of adjectives uh, the same list of adjectives and say, okay, which of these adjectives are most descriptive of men? Which of these adjectives are most descriptive of women? And which of these adjectives are most descriptive of leaders? And the leaders and men adjective list, of course, overlaps much more. Mm. So, so she enters and women enter the workforce with this basic, you know, um, bias in which the characteristics of leaders overlaps more with the characteristics typically attributed to men. Mm. And how do women make that up? I mean, just passing off Hillary for a moment, like, what do they need to do? I mean, is it just consciousness of these differences? Or, I mean, maybe, well, you maybe know, an idea for another book? Uh, no, I don't think I have an idea for another book. I mean, so, so to some extent, if you look at the representation of women in senior positions in, in, in law firms, in senior positions in corporate America, in senior positions in academia, the sad story is, is that there's a limit to what you can do. Um, that, uh, the, that the bias exists and that it has consequences. Um, but uh, in the words of one of the women who will come to our Women in Power panel uh, later in February, you know, women have to be uh, twice as good to get half the recognition, but fortunately we're four times as good. I mean, you have, you, 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 what you cannot do, and which I think many women are tempted to do, is to conform to the gender role expectations. You know, I'm supposed to be empathetic, I'm supposed to be vulnerable, I'm supposed to be all these things, which, by the way, do not overlap mm. with the list of adjectives assigned to leaders. So I think, you know, women need to uh, be as tough as the men, maybe tougher. Right. So coming back to our, um, our path to power president-elect and soon to be our path to power president, um, what did you what did you think about the way he ran his campaign or even how he's how he's conducting himself now that emphasizes, you know, I guess this part of him being able to to attract and keep power? Um so it's interesting. I have a friend named Henry Timms, who's the head of the 92nd Street Y, which is a very influential Y in New York City, who is the uh, founder, Henry is, of Giving Tuesday and is writing a book on new power. And I sent Henry an email just actually yesterday, and I said, we now have our first new power president. How do you like it? <laughs> and of course, he does it. Um, I, th I think people had assumptions about social media and their effects, that this was going to democratize uh, with the world, with the facts at your fingertips, that there was going to be more evidence rather than less used. There was going to be a deconcentration of power. It was going to be, you know, whatever. And I think the, what the, what the experience of this election has shown is that, um, is that the effect of digital media is not, and, and, and all this interconnectedness is not quite what people had anticipated. And, uh, and we'll have to see how that sorts itself out. But Trump is a master of the new media. I mean, this is not... This is not, I think, what the millennials had in mind when when they think about you know social media and its use. But but he's fa I I actually do not believe that he would have been president um, absent Twitter. Right. So we have Dorsey to thank for something else. <laughs> yes, we have Dorsey to thank for Donald <laughs> Trump. Um, you know, I mean, the, the 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 technology is not just you know Dorsey's, but uh, but uh, but no, I think I think I think Donald is a is a master of social media, and he was he was certainly a master of getting around the elites. The elites either, you know, so you look at the endorsements. I mean, people endorsed Hillary who had never endorsed a Democrat before. Did it matter? 
Not that I could tell. Right. Uh, uh, he ran against his, his nomination was basically against all of the Republican establishment. And he was able to overcome all of that through his, um, through his use of, uh, of, of social media. Well, he I mean, basically bypasses the elites. Well, one of the arguments is potentially that if you're speaking to this disaffected minority slash majority, that everything we thought was a benefit was actually, you know, was actually a curse. So all the newspaper endorsements, you know, when, when she gets endorsed by the New York Times, his electorate goes, well, I don't want someone endorsed yeah. by the New York Times, right? That's very, very interesting. I mean, he also has just a persona of just doing this for an extended yes. period of time. Well, right? he, has, he, has, he has a persona of, so I wrote a column in Fortune Probably in 2015, maybe in August, if my memory serves, which basically said everything – Donald Trump, I think, exemplifies – um, the, the, the lesson of my book, Leadership BS, which is the prequel to power that what came up, uh, came out afterwards. Um, and in that book, I point out that the qualities that we say we don't want in leaders is actually precisely the qualities that we choose and select for. Right. Like, and, and, and in fact, Donald Trump is in the index. Such as? Modesty. Right. We say we say we want modest leaders, level five, you know, good to great, etc. We the, the 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 research evidence is overwhelming. The narcissism, self aggrandizement, and self promotion is is it predicts being chosen into leadership positions, the tenure in leadership positions, uh, the salary that you earn, all of these things. We say we want the truth. We actually don't want the truth. My favorite song is you know Fleetwood Mac. Tell me lies. Tell me sweet little lies. We want to hear how great we are. We want to hear that everything. Everything's going to be okay. We want the so so you know. I mean, in, in in terms of you know, so the so what I pointed out is that many of the qualities that we were criticizing Trump for narcissism, not being a little loose with the facts to put it mildly, mm-hmm. um, aggressive. Uh, yes, were all things that actually were going to work in his favor. Mm. I mean. The misogyny and all of that. I mean, is that a step too far, or is that it was still part of the plan? Um, I think that's probably a step um, a little too far. But his reaction to the accusations, I think, is not. He right. was never – It's we have talked about this. We've only had three classes. We probably talked about it in two of the three, maybe three out of the three. He never ran away from any of his statements – he never apologized. He never really backed down. So he, he was willing to own anything he said. And therefore, you know, after a while, people, you know, first of all, give up trying to get him to admit that he made a mistake. That's number one. And number two, people give up. You know, if you own what, what you've said, then maybe people come to think, well, you know, maybe it's not so bad after all. Mm. He also seemed to um, – one of the things I've been thinking about recently is he saturated the news cycle to a degree that people weren't used to. So suddenly he there did. was an allegation. There was just more news and people just had to keep reporting the new stuff, right? I know. Uh, yes. So he he is – Heaven help us! He was a, he was a creature of the news of of the news media, right. and they fed each other. So CNN, MSNBC was virtually on the verge of being closed down. He saved M- MSNBC. He saved the profits of CNN, and in turn, they made him because you would turn on you know Rachel Maddow or whatever your favorite MSNBC show was, and it was Donald Trump, Donald Trump, Donald Trump all the time. And after a while, you know, if I'm going to sell you a Toyota. I can't sell you a Toyota by telling you how bad for th- for 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 three and five four hours how bad Honda is because mm-hmm. after a while you're going to say what is this Honda that they keep talking about I better go see what it is and you, you've elevated its importance you've elevated its its visibility you've given it exposure and the mere exposure effect is a very powerful effect so so he he was created by the media. Uh, and he in turn, uh, you know, there's this wonderful symbiotic relationship, relationship in which he, he, he brought, brought them ratings. They brought him attention. Mm. I mean, I think, uh, especially being in, as you say, in Northern California, the, the perception is that, oh, well, um, our, our need for power is different. And, you know, that's the middle of America wanted that kind of leader, right? You're saying it's across the board. Everyone looks for the similar traits. Um, I would say I'm not saying that Trump carried the vote in Northern California, which, of yeah. course, he did not. But I'm saying if you look at the Silicon Valley, Valley leaders, you look at Elon Musk, you look at Steve Jobs, you look at Larry Ellison, you look at uh, – who, by the way, has had I don't know how many wives. Um, you look at uh, uh, Jeff Bezos of Amazon. 
they you know, are they immodest? Absolutely. Are they self-aggrandizing? Absolutely. Are they a little free with the facts? Absolutely. I mean, Jobs has this phrase about him, reality distortion field. Mm-hmm. Uh, the software industry has this phrase about it called vaporware. Mm-hmm. I mean, you know, so I mean, the, 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 the characteristics and qualities of many of these leaders are not that dissimilar. Do you think his, um, I mean, do you think his message mattered? I mean, do you think he got lucky at the time and that his particular style and rhetoric and influence just nailed on to, I guess, as you say, I mean, could he have been a Democratic candidate running Absolutely. against George W. Bush? Absolutely. It wouldn't have been. A- Absolutely, because, because one of the interesting things about Trump and one of the interesting things about today's world is that, you know, we talk about being in a post-fact world. I'm not exactly sure what that means, but I can guess. I think we're, I think Trump was certainly a post-ideological president. I mean, I mean, he has said, uh, on any given issue, he said birds of basically everything, yeah. particularly if you go back over the course of his life. But even over the course of the last, you know, 18 months, yeah. you know, is he for or against abortion rights? Is he for or against whatever? The one constant in Donald Trump's whatever is that Donald Trump is in favor of Donald Trump. Uh, you know, as I said, the, the one prediction I will make about this administration, the Clintons made a lot of money when they left office. Trump's going to make a lot of money while he's in office. Right. I mean, I guess one of the concerning things is most people think we're only in for a four-year ride, but based on everything you've said, it it very well might be eight. Who knows? It depends. I mean, I think it's all completely unpredictable. He is apparently going to take the oath of office with the lowest approval ratings of any incoming president. Mm -hmm. Um, it, it, It depends. I mean, the interesting thing about narcissists, and he is a narcissist, he's in Michael Maccabee's book, The Productive Narcissist, which is now probably 20 years old, maybe older than that. Um, this he's, he's not particularly, none of this is particularly new. Um, you know, one of the things about narcissists is that they're not very good at self-regulating their behavior. They're not very good at taking advice from other people. Mm. They're not very good at listening. Um, and so he could get himself into big trouble and get impeached, or he could be a big success. I think um, one of the things that you see in the research on narcissistic leaders is that they are – uh, they either do fabulously or they crash and burn, uh, but but it's a it's, it's a variance amplifying thing. All uh, right. So I mean, is that your feeling uh, about the presidency that it's kind of a binary option at this point um, for him? Probably, yeah. it's either going to do great or it's going to be a catastrophe. Who knows? Wow. Um, I just wanted to touch. I mean, just while we're on that, there seems to be this perception at the moment that we have this kind of era of big man politics. You know, Putin, some of the some of the rising guys, Trump. Um, but I guess you would probably say that that's the way the world has always been. Um, I think the world has probably always been that way. I think we have certainly a rise of rightist politicians, including Marine Le Pen in France. Yeah. So it's not a man, but it's yeah. a woman. But certainly the rise of the strong men in Turkey, in Hungary. In Poland, um, uh, yes. Uh, so there's there's certainly a, a move to the right, um, mm-hmm. and uh, and some people uh, will tell you that that's a consequence of the um, economic insecurity, which is pervasive in the world today. Uh, there's studies that go back decades that uh, that try to relate lynchings in the South of African Americans uh, to economic conditions. Uh, to take an extreme case of of how the economy plays into um, kind of bad behavior. Um, so so maybe there is some. Uh, An economic security is not just confined to the U.S. Stagnating incomes is not confined just to the U.S. Uh, the replacement of jobs by robots is certainly not confined just to the U.S. So there's economic insecurity worldwide, and that may account for the rise of the right. I don't know. This is not particularly my my field. But there's certainly a rise of, of – um, of strong authoritarian leaders. Mm. This is after, after all, if you say, you know, what the, people forget, uh, before Adolf Hitler was Adolf Hitler, Adolf Hitler was a politician who won an election. Um, and, uh, and, 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 and in a, in a country which was facing extreme economic circumstances. Mm. And so that would be yet another example of how extreme economic circumstances lead to the rise of, you know, dictators, authoritarians, uh, rightists. I guess just, uh, touching on your last point, you just mentioned automation briefly. I guess, you know, we were entering an area where, Power has never been more important, right? Because being able to have some control of your destiny, you know, 
might allow you to not become redundant as more and more of these jobs go to automation. Oh, that is certainly the case, but I don't know exactly. <laughs> I don't know how to accomplish that, but I think part of that way to accomplish that is you need to build a unit. You, you need to build a personal brand. You need to build something that makes you unique and not replaceable by, you know, a machine. Mm. And part of that is skill, but part of that is also brand. And I'd encourage all of my listeners to buy your book and find out how to do that. Uh, Professor Pfeffer, thank you very much for coming on Blindspot. It's been a pleasure to be with you. <laughs>